Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm truly delighted uh, for this opportunity to have a conversation with João Pedro Rodrigues. Uh, I confess personally that uh, uh, I, fi I find uh, the work of João Pedro Rodrigues striking and, and, and daring. And uh, I never know, uh, as, much, uh, as much as I watch his films, I never, when he, he releases a new film, uh, at any moment, I'm never able to guess what will happen next. He has this effect continuously of surprise in his narratives. Um, I hope you enjoyed the morning uh, screening. Uh, I'll be starting with a few questions, but then we have a, a roving mic, uh, and you'll be free to ask uh, uh, João Pedro Rodrigues about uh, everything you think it's relevant for the experience you're uh, having now at, at FilmEU, both in terms of um, his career, uh, his films, or even his, uh, his ideas, okay? Uh, really take this opportunity. Um, João Pedro Rodrigues, thank you so much for being here uh, at Lusófona within the FilmEU project. Um, João Pedro Rodrigues, as I mentioned in the morning, is a filmmaker that managed <laughs> in Portugal, is a, is, a, is a bumblebee. He managed, amidst all the difficulties, to have a, a solid uh, body of work. Uh, I would like to start perhaps by asking you, uh, because we have so present, and for some of the students, this was the, the first time they actually watched one of your films. Um, how it uh, how it was to uh, from idea uh, to script to development to 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 have the film produced, uh, especially with the uh, with the uh, with the film we screened in the morning, the ornithologist. Uh, how was your journey? Was it uh, an easy one? Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I've been in this university for a couple of times already. Um, you're you're asking me about specifically this this film. Yes, because um, it's the one okay. that uh, I, this was a very <laughs> hard film to make, because but it not the reasons were mostly reasons that are not they are connected with if you're doing films if you're working on film, e, you. Eventually, but perhaps unfortunately, sometimes you have to deal with them because I had a lot of production uh, problems with this film, uh, with my producers. And that is something that is often, that often happens, but I wish it didn't happen. So it was very hard, but well, the film, let me think about it because every film it takes so long to make a film, especially the features, that uh, that's why I... This is working? Yes. Um, I often go back to short films because I... Mm, I don't like to be without work and I don't, I don't like to be... just not making films. It's, for me, uh, it's a pleasure to make films. It's not a... Um, it's not a, it's not painful it's not a, because i see that often i was before i i started making my own films i worked with other directors portuguese directors yeah i have always worked here as an assistant and in the editing uh, process and sometimes i saw it, it was not a as if they were not having pleasure in what they were doing and for me that was very puzzling and i think it reflects on the films that sometimes they were making um this to say that I'm the films that I make are ba they they have a lot of uh, I had a lot of difficulties while doing them, but uh, I would say artistically they are if they have uh, if I I'm not I don't know I'm not aiming to make a perfect film I I think there are perfect perfect films but uh, but all the um, how Shall I put this? Uh, it's all my responsibility somehow, uh, artistically. If they, I, I don't know. If I don't also, I don't watch them. Uh, I don't. W I don't like to go back to them. Uh, so it's only these moments when I have to talk about the films that I, not that I 
because they are too present in, inside of me. And so my work is when I go, I want to move forward and I want to forget what I've done before. So, and this is also difficult because each film takes, I, going back to what I was saying, each film takes so much time uh, since like the, the idea, also like what is the idea? It's, all, it's very, sometimes it's an image, sometimes it's, um, I don't, it's a place, sometimes it's someone, uh, but it mostly comes from my personal experience, or it doesn't mean it's autobiographical. It, I mean, it's, uh, it comes also from, like, f from other films, perhaps, like seeing other films, uh, reading, uh, from painting, from, I don't know, from, from life itself. Uh, and this film, uh, I, before studying film, I studied biology, and I wanted to be an ornithologist. So um, since I was, I don't know, my, I was eight and my father gave me a, a pair of binoculars. You say binoculars, right? And um, I spent my, most of my, since I was eight until, I don't know, until my early 20s watching birds. And uh, because my, f my parents, they both come from, not from Lisbon, they, we have, I don't know, from the villages outside of Lisbon. And we spent a lot of time there, uh, like weekends and uh, holidays. And, and I, since I was very young, I wanted to make a catalog of all the birds that, um, uh, that existed in those places. And I have this obsession of being uh, a, 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 some, some sort of like rationalist uh, uh, of order. For me, order is very important. And, uh, and then when I, so I went, I did my, both my parents are also from science, so I, I think I was influenced by that going into biology. Uh, but when I went to, 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 the, to the university to study biology, I already knew that I didn't, that it wasn't what I wanted to do. But I was very young, I was, I don't know, I, I think I went to university with, seven, I was 17. And, um, and I was very much uh, upset with the people there. I think that was the reason that <laughs> made me leave and change. Not that it, wa it was what made me change to film, but I, I didn't like the people because they were too narrow-minded. Uh, they were people that were just interested by, um, I don't know, by biology or by mathematics, or they didn't have a world. They couldn't speak about anything else, and they just studied, studied, and they memorized everything because it's it's not very difficult science. Uh, if you just want to get good grades, you just memorize everything, and it's it's uh, it's really easy. And so um, then, of course, scientists are much more are clever persons that are, but <laughs> it's much it's another degree of knowledge. But um, and so uh, I. When I was also, I don't know, like 15, I started going very much to the cinema, to the, to the Cinematheque here. And I was also, I, I tend to be like an, obs obs uh, an obsessive person, and I w went to every screening. My parents, I was, I don't know, I was, I was 15, and I spent all my day in the cinema, and my parents were furious with me, and they didn't want me to go, that uh, let me go to the cinema so often. But I, I tend to do things like, obsessively and um, so I studied I don't know one year yeah of, uh, at, uh, at the faculty of biology and then I changed to the film school here and at the time there were some teachers that were very important for me because there were they were still the uh, I don't know, you perhaps you don't know much about Portuguese cinema, but uh, we had a sort of nouvelle vague as the French New Wave um, had uh, in the 60s. And there were names like uh, Paulo Roche, Antonio Reis, um, who else was there? Uh, Jorge Silva Mel, that is a little bit a generation afterwards, but um, they were very... Uh, Alberto Seixas Santos, it's also a little bit later. 
but um, they were really they were people that were working on f in, in f they were working uh, on films at the time. They were not just teachers, and for me that was very important because we could follow them to their shootings, and uh, it was we could experience cinema in a way that uh, I think sometimes. When there's a school, there's just people that are just theor uh, theoretical, or they are they are not connected with the profession. You 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 see things uh, differently. I think. Uh, I think it's very important to experience uh, a shooting, for instance. And for me, that was very um, it was crucial. I would say, uh, and perhaps that's why also I when I when I finished film school, I was like 23 or 24. I don't remember anymore. And then I studied in other people's uh, I, s I worked on other people's films. Um, and I just made my first short, uh, I don't know, professional short when I was 30. And, uh, but for me it was that, and it's something that n doesn't happen so often nowadays because people start working on their own f in their own films because it's also easier. There was no video cameras. There were video cameras, but not as small, as cheap as the ones that you can get here uh, now. So um, making films meaning was meant that uh, you had to have a movie camera. Uh, you can we could work on 16 millimeter, but mostly it was 35 millimeter. Uh, and um, it was, well, a lot of money. Most of, uh, you could do things cheaply and many people throughout film history did things much cheaper. But uh, if you wanted to do like in a professional way, it meant like that. So um, this to say, I, I'm totally aware of what you asked. No, me. it's wonderful. I don't uh, have to do anything. <laughs> You're giving us a masterclass. It's really no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I no, no. But it's it, it's excellent. I can I, I can put you back on track. But I think for uh, for our students, it's great to to understand that it was not just immediately a snap that you started yeah. to, to but be but the context uh, was different at the time also yes and i think that's a uh, worthwhile understanding um, to go back to the question but okay. feel free to drift uh, okay. away this is your show <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what i was asking is that uh, for them to understand uh, what are uh, let's say um, the challenges of contemporary production for an idea as this one to become a film from idea to script mm -hmm. development production getting the funding getting can you tell us a bit of of the story of this particular film I if it was if it was easy uh, if it was a struggle if it's always a struggle uh, from making the film to 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 reaching the audience I think it's always a struggle, even between, I like, inside. Uh, it's a struggle with myself. It's also because I'm not a person that has a million ideas, uh, I would say. So I don't have each, I, I do one film after the other. I don't have, uh, like, s several projects that I'm working at the, sa at the same time. I'm sort of lying now because that's what's happening now. Because I, 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 I also got tired of making this effort each time I have to start one new idea, one new film. But I, anyhow, I don't have a million ideas so uh, of stories, I would say. So um, I think the, I the main idea came from the fact that's why I told you that I wanted to be an ornithologist. This story somehow I'm imagining if I wouldn't have drifted towards cinema, if I would have been an ornithologist, not that this would be my story, <laughs> but uh, it's, an, uh, it's a possibility of a story. And also after living uh, and after having experienced much more things than the ones that I, have e I had experienced when I was uh, the age I, I, I was studying biology. So uh, I, w I was also, I'm, I've become more interested in Portuguese mythology. Like that's why there's this, this, the, f the, f the patron saint of Lisbon, uh, Saint Anthony, has such a big role in this film perhaps. And I started becoming interested, I made a short film uh, you also don't know about Portuguese story, but um, 
the date of um, the b it's it's the birth of the death. No, I think it's the birth of Saint Anthony. It's the 13th of uh, June. It, there's a big celebration in Por in Lisbon and in the cities around Portugal where that are they, that have Saint Anthony as their patron. Uh, and people, it's at the same time a religious um, uh, feast, but there's people go out not anymore because we can't <laughs> cannot <laughs> party anymore. But uh, back in the days when you could party, um, people go out and they get drunk and they get wasted. And so there's this mix between something that is religious and um, there's a lot of ritual. And at the same time, it's a very, I don't know, almost the opposite, uh, like people getting drunk and uh, getting crazy. And I did a short film about a bunch of young people that came back home after partying. And the short film is mostly about that. It's called Morning of St. Anthony's Day. And so that was sort of my first approach to, the, to this figure. And then I became interested about um, how does this mythology live in, in myself first, and also in, in Portugal nowadays, how do you deal with, the, with, the, with this figure that is very much present in every church you go, in every, in every household, there's always, not always, but uh, uh, Portugal is a Catholic country, uh, traditionally Catholic, people are traditionally Catholic. Uh, and they have a, a little um, a little figure of Saint Anthony. I, d I forgot because I was going to bring <laughs> bring. There's a in Caldas da Rainha. Caldas da Rainha is a small village a little bit north of Portugal, and where they have um, a lo they make these little sculptures that are somehow criticizing and mocking uh, these figures like Saint Anthony or policemen or these state figures. And they, there's a usually they're men, yeah, they're men, and there's the it's a, a robed figure like Saint Anthony. Uh, it's like a man, like a, he has a cloak of a Saint a Franciscan cloak, and then there's a little string, and then you 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 <laughs> I was going to bring it, <laughs> <laughs> and because it's more it's more effective you see if you see it, and then if you 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 pull the string. And the rope lifts, and there's a penis that comes uh, <laughs> from below, uh, under the, the cloak. And this is actually true. Uh, uh, no, it's really true. And I there's this satirical. So what I, I think that was the mo main influence for my film. N not, <laughs> but so that th that's this figure that something that is like, sort of like, uh, you're dealing about uh, a Catholic mythology, but it's that is somehow perverted by the, this uh, popular uh, satirical uh, culture. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I wanted to make a film that was only set in nature with no interior spaces because I didn't want to use light uh, to, uh, we used some light, but uh, not light to, 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 to um, how do you say that? To create uh, artificial? Uh, yeah, to, to uh, inside spaces. So the only, the only house you see, it's the house that comes, it's a ruined house that you, it comes at the end of the film. And then, of course, there's uh, the, um, he, they arrive, the, the couple in the end, they arrive to uh, Padova in Italy. And that is uh, the story of Saint Anthony, briefly, it's, it was a man called Fernando de Bulhões that was born in Lisbon uh, in the 13th century. And uh, he went to study, he was from a rich family, and he went to study uh, to Coimbra. And in Coimbra he saw this uh, um, uh, Franciscan uh, uh, monks. Uh, yeah, monks, you say monks. Uh, and he was very much moved by these people that uh, didn't have anything. They just wanted to help the poor and um, and lived with nothing, and uh, with no, with just the cloaks and barefooted. And uh, 
he was very moved by by and so he became a franciscan and he went to um africa with uh, some to morocco with the uh, other um, priests and he was chased uh, and he had to escape and he took a boat and the boat uh, was caught on a s in a storm and uh, drifted until Italy, the south of Italy, in the Mediterranean. And then he went up, he met uh, St. Francis, uh, and he became uh, one of the leaders, I would say, of the Franciscan uh, creed. Um, and, um, and so I loosely based my story when I started, uh, like, thinking about the plot, the what would happen in the film. Uh, the film, uh, well, it started like as a perhaps a something that I knew myself was how to watch birds and being outside in nature watching birds. And then I loosely tightened um, the, the, the storyline around these happenings that from uh, St. Anthony's life. Uh, and but thinking that all that is written about his life, it's sort of uh, untrue or irreal because unreal because you don't know first if you because it's something that was written in the 16th century, like three, four hundred years after he was born, the, the biographies that exist, and it's mostly invented, so you don't really know if it's true or not. Uh, uh, so with this idea of something that is mythological already and um, and so the that's why in the film the there's the, the, the he's going down the river uh, inside a kayak and he's uh, he's caught in a in the rapids so I I transposed somehow the, s the real st the real which is not real uh, story of Saint Anthony to uh, to modern days and with kayaks and not a, a boat with full of uh, of monks, uh, and he was alone because mostly when you watch birds, you you watch uh, birds alone. As he was, he's a sort of a scientist. He's looking for black storks, which is a bird that is quite sort of. Um, it's not almost extinct, but there's not many uh, black storks in the world. Uh, it's not uh, managed to be extinct, but it was, it, for some years, it was a very rare. Rare, rare. It was very rare to, to and but now, uh, so he's looking for black storks and then something, uh, he has an accident and his life is somehow uh, turned upside down. And then it's sort of like an adventure film. Uh, and sort of like also a Western film. He's like the lonely hero in nature and dealing with several characters that he meets along the way. Until in the end, until that in the end, because uh, Saint Anthony, the real, I would say, like I always put in, uh, in commas, uh, was buried in Padova in Italy. So, uh, and he died there. So in the end, he's, he gets there somehow. It's uh, sort of it's uh, somehow ironical be because he also gets there as a couple. Uh, but um, that's was somehow how I, I constructed the 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 the, s the story of the film. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions, but I, uh, perhaps I I'm going to open it uh, straight away. Does anyone in the audience have a a question for for João Pedro Rodrigues. We have a roving mic. This is your chance here at the front. Go for it. Go for it, guys. <laughs> Hello, I'm Alessia BFM Estonia. So I really like the movie because I saw some kind of Estonian style as well there, and uh, it was pretty nice. And I have one question uh, about your just style uh i saw that you were used a lot of like wide shots and uh, the medium shots and all the takes was pretty long like the um, like you are inside the shot 
and only in a few things you used um, these close-ups. That was in the beginning one one moment, and in the end when character was changed to Anthony. So my question is why? Um. I think when I, I usually, when I write a script, I'm already thinking about the, the decoupage. You, you understand, you, you say decoupage in, how do you say that in English? I don't know. We have similar word in yeah, you, okay. <laughs> well, So how the, the, how the storyboard. Yeah, how the storyboard I, I, don't, I don't really draw a storyboard because I'm a very bad drawer, but uh, I, it's, alre it's already in the script. First, just by words, I try to make the script as simple and as visual as I can. I can, and so most of the work is it's like choosing the right word in order that someone who would, who will r read the script can understand visually how the film will look like. So it's very precise the the my style of writing, and I. And I like that idea of precision, of uh, knowing already when I'm going to shoot, how I'm, I'm going to frame the, the characters, the, the landscape, whatever, the, whatever I'm framing. Um, and um, I, all this, uh, the decoupage means, because I think the story is also told by the decoupage, by the, by the way you frame the your s y what you sh you're shooting, so it means if you're closer, you have different emotion than if you're uh, far away from from the character, and so it's not just by dialogue and uh, that the story is told. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, the story is mostly told by the way you shoot and the way uh, and the also the sound is very important but not just the words also what you the, the the noises or if there's music if there's not music i tend to have not a lot of music because i i think it's it's li like if there's a close a close up it has to mean something in that specific moment and it, uh, if there's music because i often see films that have always music just to make it faster i don't really understand the purpose uh, often uh, where's why there's music um, this I, I'm not saying that I'm against music uh, at all but I, I, it has to be used in the in the right moments where it's needed um, for instance in this film I I just there's a song in the end which is a song that it's an important song in Portugal uh, by Antonio Variações, who, who was this uh, extravagant uh, queer singer that was also um, a hairdresser in the 80s. Uh, and he was the first known person in Portugal that died with AIDS. Um, and, um, and then there's music, there's cello music that is some sort of Ambiental music. It's um, it's very weird. It was um, it's a, a composer that I met when I was I was a, a year at Harvard at Harvard University and uh, doing a fellowship, and uh, I met her there, and uh, funnily enough, she's now here because I'm I'm wor I'm now I'm working on in the mixing the sound mixing of my new film. And she also composed the music, and so she's here uh, <laughs> mixing the film with us at, the, at this moment. Um, and uh, so it's much more, it's music, but it's some, I don't know, it's her music. It's some sort of like this more, I don't know, it's, it's something that she composes looking at the images uh, and looking at the film and making, I don't know, it's something that goes inside the images and inside the other sounds. Uh, uh, abstract? Uh, it's not really abstract because I think it's emotion. For me, the, 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 the key word is always emotion. Uh, but emotion, it's also a very, I don't know, emotion is different for, for everyone. So 
uh, when I'm doing my own films, I my the the I'm my own. I would say it has to move me f from this uh, in the in the beginning, and then I start mo showing the film to other people. Uh, but uh, but going back to the to the to your question, I, I think it's really important for me. It's I it's really important to know what I'm going to shoot uh, before, um, be because then when you are with other people, when when during the shooting, uh, the real shooting, it sometimes it also becomes different because there's a tension that uh, that you cannot produce yourself when you're writing in front of a TV, uh, um, a computer screen, writing your film. It's like with the actors. It's also different uh, because because I usually do a lot of rehearsals, uh, but there's no, we don't there. It's impossible to reach that tension during the rehearsals. It's just like uh, the crew, the actors together, the fact that you know that usually uh, the schedules are quite tight and you don't have uh, because of also production problems. Uh, I usually it for me it's very important to have time to shoot uh, and um, it's one of when I ask my producer is always uh, I, I have to have t because nowadays you can make a f like a, a feature film in four or five weeks and that is very very short I usually take eight nine weeks but this doesn't mean that for instance I just finished another film that I still haven't edited a film that will be a short feature, like around one hour, that I did in two weeks. So it's also, there's always, you, you have to go around constraints and to go around trying to think what is, b what is better for the film uh, artistically and uh, to make it uh, successful in the way I, I imagined it. But uh, there's this question of time, uh, of budget, uh, also, this fight with production that happened in this film was very. Mm, you have to find a way to get around that and and to make your own idea come uh, as as my, as closer as to the idea that you had when I when when I imagined the the film. Uh, any other questions? Uh, First here, and then we ha we'll go to the back. Uh, hi. Uh, you say you do everything obsessively. Uh, you said that. Do you think it also translates to your films, to your way of directing? You, you see the a pattern of obsessively? I know I'm obsessive. I don't know if it's... Uh, I'm sure it translates because I'm, I'm also a, a some sort of a control freak, and I, I want to do everything myself. So I, I control everybody, and uh, uh, so I'm. So I, I think it will surely. It means uh, it shows uh, on the way I'm doing, uh, uh, because every little detail, I, it's usually me who decides. The so, of course, with my crew, I usually work with the same crew, since my first film. So. Okay. And I like that. I like to, to work with the same people, like the, the DOP, the sound engineer, um, the art director. Um, and that is important because somehow we, we, we found a way that we work together, that we don't have to talk so much and to explain so much, perhaps. Um, and I, and there's, a, there's a trust also. I think they trust me and I trust them. And for me that, so there's no conflict somehow. The conflict is usually with, uh, with production. <laughs> uh, the conflict is always with production. W wha I had a teacher, was George Silvermel, who told me that um, production is always your enemy. And I thought, oh, this is stupid. This is, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't, but it's sort of true. You just have to go around and to seduce your enemies. Uh, and it, it somehow, it, it's, it is often difficult. <laughs> <to> <laughs> so 
so you know the producers will need to be the tough ones yeah. here <laughs> to film you. Now to the uh, to the back, we have already a question there. Uh, my name is Tristan. I'm com come from BFM and I study sound design. And first of all, thank you for the film and sharing it with us. It was marvelous. I have two questions. First of all, uh, let's talk about the birds. <laughs> I noticed um, there was this kind of owl perspective. And I would like you to explain the symbolism of owl. And I have one other question as well. Did you use deliberately the sounds of some birds which were not in the environment? En environment, and uh, uh, was there any any species of birds which are, for example, not living in this kind of environment? No, no. All birds that that you listen and that you see are birds that are that live there. Uh, it doesn't mean that some s some sounds were were recorded or comes from s from libraries that uh, but and they were mixed there, but all the sounds they are all from native birds from 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 that place. For me, that is also also I think I think back of when I was very obsessed with with. With, with cataloging the birds that existed in the, in the places where I went when I was a child, and uh, it, for me it's anti-natural to to my to, to like for instance like usually when you see an eagle uh, in in a lot of American film or n not so also European films there's the sound of an American eagle which is totally unreal, uh, and for me that is very disturbing. Uh, <laughs> I I have a, I it's all very s somehow scientific what you the the there's um there's nothing anti natural um but I perhaps I interrupted you I you didn't finish the question or you had finished the question uh, what what about the owls oh the owl uh, the owl has a lot of symbolism uh, as a bird, but uh, the owl um, there's not just the, the point of view of the owl, but there's the point of view of birds. Because and this uh, and I use the camera. I use the a GoPro a camera, which is a camera that I don't like at all. Uh, and uh, but I, when I thought of using it, because we had to to have a camera that could fly. And uh, nowadays in every film there's GoPro shots with uh, this camera hovering cities or hovering places. I really hate that. Uh, but I, I try to use it uh, in a way that I thought was necessary for the film. So, so in a way that how, when I was young I always thought, I'm looking at the birds, do they see me? What do they see? Uh, and it was with this very basic uh, idea that I changed the point of view to their point of view. Uh, because I don't know if you understood this, some people understand it, some people don't. But uh, the birds start seeing someone else in the character. There's, uh, in some moments when you ch I changed the point of view of the birds, and it's not the actor, it's not Paul Ami anymore. Paul Ami is the main character of the film who plays Fernand. But then in the end it's me. So, um, and in some shots it starts when he's tied by the Chinese girls. And there's a, there's a reverse shot and there's, the, the, there's this uh, black stork that looks at, uh, at the character. And then first he sees Paul Ami, the same, but shot with a, go with a GoPro. And then he sees me, I'm tied as he is tied. Um, and with this idea that somehow birds could see the change that is produced, that is producing itself in, in, in the character. So he's, he will become Saint Anthony. He doesn't know uh, that he will become Saint Anthony in the end. And Saint Anthony in the end is not him anymore, it's me. And that comes back, of course, to the, that idea that I. I was an ornithologist, not that I'm a saint, 
I'm <laughs> not, nothing close to, <laughs> to a saint. But uh, it also comes to the idea and that um, when I started writing the film, I thought that I could play the role myself. But then uh, it, <laughs> it became obvious that I, it was too, I, I couldn't stand seeing myself for such a long time. <laughs> And I'm not a very good actor, so um, I mm, so I abandoned that idea. But it's there's something that stayed, and that was something that, in the final transformation, he when he becomes Saint Anthony, I, I say this uh, everything in commas. Uh, it's not him anymore; it's me. So, but it's just it's me because it makes sense of like my background, my ornithologist background, but also this this idea of change. Uh, it's something that always hap often happens in my films, that character change changes, even physically. And uh, uh, so... Yeah. Did that answer your question? Uh, any more questions in the audience? One at the front, can you pass over the mic, please? Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you because I didn't understand the end of the movie. Mostly the second hour of the movie, I, I found it a little bit confusing and not very related with the first half. So I understand there's a travel, that there's a trip of transformation and in the end the character is transformed, but I didn't understand, for example, the scene of with the horses and the women. And I, I wanted to ask, um, in the end, what what did you want the audience to feel or to expect of the movie? Uh, so just to say, it's Andre from Lusofen University. If when you ask the questions, you can just uh, say your name and where you're coming from. Okay. Um, it's I. It's a hard question to to answer because I I when I'm making a film, I'm not really. I don't really know what people would think about it or that they would have a clear uh, or at least I don't want to say it myself. I, I think that the fact that you say it, you're puzzled, perhaps uh, you stayed with that p you're puzzled uh, but uh, and you didn't uh, you didn't understand it it also it's also something not just. You can not understand the film and perhaps not like it or like it. It depends uh, on your your own feelings, but um, but I can tell you something about like the women. Um, for me, they are s sort of like messengers that they w sh they would they will name him Anthony. Uh, she she names him Anthony. There's there's she's sort of like. Um, uh, a mythological, c like Diana, the, the 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 huntress, the the the, the goddess, uh, and so in the end, I think the film reached a sort of um, mythological turmoil, and I hope that the the fact that were these uh, these uh, women uh, bare-breasted like the Amazons. Uh, would be they, they would uh, I would say uh, you could believe they could exist in a in a sort of mythological um, uh, forest where you where there's not just them but I used somehow the carretes you know carretes because you're, if you're Portuguese the the guys that are dressed with this uh, the, the the guys that make these rituals, uh, it's something that really exists in the north of Portugal. Uh, in the, pla the film was shot in the north of Portugal along the river Douro, which makes the border between Spain and Portugal. And there's a tradition of uh, these young, uh, young boys, usually it's, no, it's only boys because it's uh, also a rite of passage of growing up. Um, when they start becoming adult, they cannot, or when they marry, they cannot be, uh, belong anymore to this, uh, to this uh, carriage, which is, uh, they, they disguise themselves with these costumes and they go around the, the villages during New Year's Eve, more or less. Um, 
and it's a sort of a pagan uh, uh, ritual that dates back before Christianity. Um, and when I was researching for the film and I went there to the north, I, I watched several years uh, because the film was long to make. So it's a project that perhaps I started writing it when in 2011 or 12, and I shot, in f I shot the, f the first birds there in 2014. Then I rewrote the script thinking about the birds that I had shot. And I shot the film in 2015, and the film was finished in 2016. And so I, as I introduced these uh, traditions, this uh, Karet tradition, this uh, into the story of the film, it's somehow I appropriate myself of a, a larger mythology, which is like uh, Diana the, the Huntress, uh, that is not specifically Portuguese, into the story. It, I, it was somehow this. And in the end, they get to, there's a couple that is, uh, established this he meets someone the the main character and they get to Padova which is as I said the resting place uh, where Saint Anthony lived uh, his life any other questions in the audience uh, about this particular issue or anything else that comes to your mind um, all these uh, students are e uh, here as part of a pilot that is, uh, the, the film is uh, Sex, Gender and Censorship. And uh, we've been dealing with this idea of what is and or is not allowed, especially because in so many countries that uh, in terms of democratic rights, uh, at the moment it seems like we're going backwards in terms of uh, how people what uh, if in terms are, are able to be in terms of um, homosexuality being represented on the screen and uh, we kind of wanted to make a statement of freedom in terms of these films and with uh, with our students and uh, because of all this i'm just wondering if at any stage of your career did you feel any pressure in terms of a censorship connected with the, the films or the iconography you depict or anything else or actually as a Portuguese filmmaker I, uh, you didn't feel that not in terms of funding or distribution and it has actually been quite okay <laughs> um, it's also a tricky question because I myself I I was never afraid to depict things as I wanted them I wanted to depict them but and I, well, I li I was born before the 1974, uh, uh, so before the revolution, and but I always lived as a Count Mark. <laughs> I was I don't know seven or eight or nine. I don't remember anymore how long old I was I. At the time, uh, I I only at least worked in freedom. So we. So I, I didn't go through the, uh, I think the films wouldn't, uh, I'm sure that I wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been made, uh, how would I say that? It wouldn't have been possible to, uh, to, make, to make the films before the revolution that I'm sure. And also there's a, I think there's a sort of, um, in Portuguese cinema, depiction of sexuality, that it's not something that is very, no, and I actually should say that perhaps four years ago at Museum of Pharma uh, Pharmacy, I was actually hosting um, a QA and a with several people, Fernando v Vendrell, Pedro Lima, that unfortunately this is the, the president of uh, the Portuguese Academy of, of Film, and we came to the realization the film was sexuality. And we came to the realization that uh, Portuguese cinema tends to be actually mainstream cinema, the ones we can watch in the, the cinemas in Portugal, tends to be very prudish. Yeah. And usually when you see sexual scenes, they are always connected with the sense of, or of violence or punishment. And your name <laughs> was the only one where people could relate uh, sexual uh, uh, scenes and pleasure, and okay. the characters having pleasure. and. Uh, I don't know if that will be 
uh, threw out a, a truthful statement, but actually your name came to mind in terms of the bit sexuality and being able to see the body, a uh, penis, mm. and 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 not uh, and the, the sexual moment being a moment of pleasure, not being a moment where the character is assaulted or going through mm. something that is not uh, nice, because other Portuguese filmmakers depict sexuality, but usually it's almost like a punishment or something that is bad that is happening uh, to that uh, particular I, I character. <laughs> Perhaps in my first film, I also depicted that also, uh, but connected with those these ideas of punishment, but in a sort of like um, role play, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because the film is also about fantasy. The, uh, my first film is called The Fantasma. And it's from 2000, and I was at the time I was very, very much concerned of like depicting something that wasn't usually depicted in films, especially in Portugal. Um, but not that I, but at the same time, it I did it the way I thought to tell that story. It was the only way to tell it. I, w I often feel that th that I have that feeling that this is the only way I could uh, film this story. I could tell this story, um, but I, even with Fantasma, I don't know, because I think, of course, we, I don't know if it would have been possible to make it now, mm -hmm. also. Uh, I Somehow we, we live in a more uh, progressive, I think, I hope, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, it's if you see changes around the world that we see some unprogressive uh, and the rise of the extreme right or uh, and these ideas in so many people that are really against this idea of, uh, of what we call progress uh, and freedom that I'm 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 a little bit concerned at the same time uh, I, I was never it was so the films, he, uh, we don't have an industry in Portugal. Uh, we we make, I don't know how many features we make each year, 12, 20? Yeah, I, s I believe 10 are funded by um, our ICA, our main uh, funding body for film. So I, 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 I my films were always supported by ICA, but, but this doesn't mean that I, for instance, the film that I will make, my new new feature, it wasn't supported when I first submitted it. It was uh, just the second time. It d this doesn't mean that even if I have a body of work already made, it doesn't mean that it's automatic that I that I I just present a, a script and they give me money. Mm -hmm. um, and I somehow I felt even if Fantasma, because it was my first film and it was some sort of perhaps shocking for some people. But I think that people just take me seriously after, a c I don't know, two or three films. Uh, uh, I, that is my impression. Uh, and we were talking about that in, that my films in, in the UK were, they have, I always felt it w they were, they, they had difficulties to, to reach the, I don't know, even festivals, uh, because they were never submitted. Uh, I, I, we submitted the films that they were never chosen. I, know, I don't know if it's something like the... It's the opposite of the United States, where they've always... Uh, they even opened in cinemas m from since my first film. <laughs> but I, I don't know... Uh, I never understood very well yeah. why what happened in the UK. In the UK, I think it's just like, from the experience of being a curator <laughs> at an <laughs> organization, I think it's just overwhelming the sheer amount of films that mm. uh, uh, apply and not as necessarily uh, an issue with censorship um, but it, it it's I it's it's important it's good to know that you you find that there is a space uh, to be free and to make your films and so far you never had any kind of brutal backlash or constraints in terms of I portraying your story. I had violent reactions, but okay. uh, from audiences, or uh, but I also learned how to deal with them or ignore them, or I don't know. I basically ignored them, but mm, but 
uh, yeah. It's <laughs> it's part of the oh, of, of the, the game. Uh, it's part <laughs> of the game. Uh, at this stage, do you have any other questions uh, to ask? Any concerns in terms of becoming uh, a filmmaker? Um, I would just like to to ask you because you uh, we've been speaking about audiovisuals uh, a lot, and you mentioned briefly the the uh, sound and even in terms of how music could be dif different in terms of its use in the soundtrack. When you are, um, let's say, at the first stage of uh, conceiving a film, d the development stage, is sound very important? Because you said you are like they're very picky with ve everything, overseeing everything. The way the sound is going to be designed, it's there at the same time, the images flow to your mind and then you will accompany also very dutifully all the process? I, I But I have to admit that visual is my, perhaps it's my first nature. But uh, of course, the li like my, my first film, that film, has no music. I was very concerned with the, I, I think often music is w overwhelming in films. There's always constant, the constant, it's a little bit like you, you listen to music everywhere. The, you cannot go to a cafe or to a place where there's always music, music, music playing. And for me that is, sorry, I like music a lot, but I like to listen to music when I want to, l to listen to music <laughs> and not like just uh, being in a constant uh, music trance. Um, so, uh, often there's even songs, like the song of uh, the end of the Ornithologies was written to be, it was written in the script. So I knew that I the film would end with this song. Uh, so, but so I'm very like I in this sound mixing. I'm always there uh, with the uh, and the sound editing. Also in the editing process, I'm always there with the with the editors. And now just a more technical question. Uh, uh, at least from the credits, it seems there was a lot of animal training happening in your film. Yeah, Did <laughs> everything go well smoothly, or <laughs> do you have no, no, some interesting <laughs> stories to tell us about having uh, animals as characters uh, within the story? No. Because the, the owl, uh, there was a question about the owl. The owl was a trained owl. Uh, because some birds are more difficult to film than other ones. W we had the first shooting w w that was sort of like a, how do you say, the Ge uh, National Geographic uh, documentary, sort of. It was a sort of National Geographic. Yeah, because we went to the rivers for I don't know for how many days, <coughs> and we just sat there, mostly in a boat, and we went with uh, real ornithologists that knew where the birds were, and we were waiting for them and uh, shooting, uh, filming them. And then that's why I said there was this first shooting, uh, like in 2014, and then with images that I watched, all the images that I had uh, made, and I rewrote the script thinking about the, if I had a, a closer view of that bird or that bird, how that would interact with the, with the character at that moment. And, but some of the birds, like the owls, I, it's, not, it's really hard to film an owl in real, in real in nature, a wild owl. And there are some either trained owls or uh, from rescue places where the uh, owls that are found uh, with a broken leg or something, and then they are trained, but they sometimes they cannot le go back to nature because they 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 lose their um, their ability to to hunt and to to feed themselves, and and so we we used uh, that also the pigeons I think the the doves the white doves uh, and. What what else there was? Horses. Oh yeah, <laughs> horses, <laughs> horses. Yeah. Shepherd uh, dog. Yeah, <laughs> those. Yeah. If you came to <laughs> to mind. Yeah, but the birds. I think there were just those two. The because all the 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 storks. 
and the, the like the black storks it's real wild storks that are in nature that we had to wait for them uh, in the places where they usually come and or to go to the nests mm -hmm. where they that these people know where they are and uh, yeah uh, any last question uh, from the audience okay not just uh, oh at the back Uh, for the people watching online, the question is, can you choose to be provocative? Uh, choose? What do you mean by choosing? Uh, do you consider yourself provocative? Oh, no. No. If I? If other people consider you uh, provocative. Sometimes they write about the saying that I'm provocative, but I, I don't feel my... I, I, I When I'm making a film, I just do the, f the film the way I think it's the right way to tell the story, no, not in a provocative way. Uh, I'm, I'm also a little bit, uh, of course I know it can be provocative, but uh, my concern is not to be provocative. You know, it came to mind that line from Monty Python, he's not a messiah, he's just a naughty boy. <laughs> um, now, uh, I'm not going to close with a, with a, with a question. I'm just looking at our students, they're just starting. They're going to, to be uh, filmmakers or people that uh, do things in film and media. And as we all know, uh, it's not like you said, science memorizing, it's tough. It's dealing with uh, lack of resources, it's dealing with other people, it's dealing with yourself. And that's so many times, and I remember even myself as a young uh, film student, you just want to give up. And you just think, what have I done with my life? What would be the advice? What can you tell them to not give up? That's hard to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's very, at least for me, I, would s I, I can say what was important for me or what is important for me. And I still go very much to the cinema. For me, it's very important to see other people's films and to be aware, not just like, I see a lot of old films, of course, but uh, I'm, I like very much to go to, and I watch all kinds of films. I, I watch Hollywood films, I watch all sorts of films. Um, because there's ideas that come from all those films and there's not, because, because sometimes, somehow it's, it happens also with film people, that film people can become a little bit like the students that I run away from biology faculty, uh, that they just know about film. Mm -hmm. They just, and for me that is very oppressive. Mm -hmm. And I want to know about, I'm curious about the world in general mm -hmm. and about all sorts of arts and um, I'm not, uh, of course I, I go very much to, to see, uh, I go almost every day to the cinema, but um, not every day, but, but I go often, sometimes two, three times a day. Uh, but I, I know that I learned a lot by watching other people's films, and I, I'm learning. I, I have this idea also that I'm learning. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, it's a process, you always learning, uh, but not just with film. It's with by books, reading books, and by w uh, seeing painting, mm. paintings, going to museums, and I don't know all sort of things going. Also, living with with other people, <laughs> not that we do that <laughs> so often <laughs> nowadays. But yeah. S but so but hopefully, it will change. So perhaps not give up because in the end, it's a field of work where you can always be learning, isn't it? And yeah, you can and have moments <laughs> of pleasure, at yeah, least that. It's very, very nice to make a film. It's very, I, I'm always uh, super scared and I, I never uh, went, I, I don't, every sc uh, shooting that I start, I'm always scared. And, but I think it's, na for me it's natural. I, 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 I I'm also, I, I'm also always questioning myself, is this right? Uh, I try to do my best somehow that's uh, and not to give up and but and you also uh, I don't know it has to be something that you believe in mm -hmm. if if it's just something to I don't know to pass time it's not worth it I think <laughs>
you should find something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you're scared, you're at the right point <laughs> for your project. Uh, thank you so much, uh, João Pedro thank Rodrigues. You. I would like to ask for your big applause. <laughs> Obrigado. Obrigado. Tobias, break now. Did you guys manage to send us your films? Yes, Yesterday films? Okay. Uh, we meet again at three, okay? Here. It's, it's in 20 minutes.